Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and in this video we will talk about pre-eclampsia, eclampsia and gestational hypertension. Gestational hypertension, pre-eclampsia and eclampsia can all be summarized under the umbrella term hypertensive disorders in pregnancy and they are a major contributor to maternal and perinatal morbidity and mortality. To give a short explanation, gestational hypertension is when the woman has high blood pressure before getting pregnant or in the very beginning of the pregnancy. Preeclampsia is high blood pressure with proteinuria and eclampsia is preeclampsia together with seizures, so you can think of it as a progression or exaggerated form of preeclampsia, pre meaning before. In the mother, hypertensive disorders during pregnancy can cause multi-organ system dysfunction such as renal failure, hepatic failure, CNS hemorrhage and stroke, pulmonary edema, placental abruption and disseminated intravascular coagulation. In the baby it can cause growth restriction, prematurity and perinatal death. The CDC has reported that preeclampsia and eclampsia are the third leading cause of maternal mortality in the US, mainly due to CNS hemorrhages. So this topic is really important and can be connected with long-term consequences for the mother and child, so early recognition, evaluation and treatment of these disorders is important. We will talk about the different diseases and how we can manage them to ensure optimal health to the mother and child and prevent the before mentioned potential complications. They of course do not always occur, it is just important to know the significance of the disorder. First a little bit about normal blood pressure changes during pregnancy. The maternal blood pressure levels usually decrease in a left lateral decubitus position so when the patient is lying on her left side, and increase when sitting. The blood pressure should always be measured when the mother is sitting and has rested for 10 minutes, as this gives us the most realistic value. The arterial blood pressure usually declines during the first two trimesters in pregnancy, compared to the average blood pressure before pregnancy, and rises in the third trimester. Now we will talk about preeclampsia. This is a syndrome unique to pregnancy and usually ends after the pregnancy is finished. In this condition, the woman develops hypertension together with proteinuria. The proteinuria, so protein in the urine, is an important component of preeclampsia and helps to differentiate preeclampsia from gestational hypertension, where the woman has high blood pressure but without proteinuria. In preeclampsia, the proteinuria is due to impaired integrity and function of the glomerular filtration barrier and a decreased tubular filtration capacity of the proteins, leading to more protein excretion into the urine. To be considered proteinuria in preeclampsia, the levels have to be at least 300 microgram or 0.3 gram in 24 hours. Women that are pregnant for the first time are more likely to develop preeclampsia. Also women that have diabetes mellitus, chronic hypertension or are pregnant with twins have an increased risk for preeclampsia. The exact reason or definitive cause why preeclampsia develops is not known. It is thought to be due to genetic, immunologic, vascular, hormonal, nutritional and behavioral factors that all can play together in the development of preeclampsia. It is also possible that a hydatiform mole or choreocarcinoma are the reason for preeclampsia. Usually it should be suspected when the preeclampsia develops in the early second trimester, so week 14 to 20, as usually preeclampsia develops after the 20th week of gestation. If you want to know more about hydatiform mole or choreocarcinoma, 
you can see our video on that in the gynecology playlist as well. What is known so far is that placental ischemia, so too little oxygen that is delivered to the placenta, plays a key role in the development of the disease. It is thought that this can be due to the failure of cytotrophoblasts, a part of the earliest development of the baby and the placenta, which leads to an invasion of the uterine spinal arteries and so a lower resistance in the utero-placental circulation. Another cause for placental ischemia is an underlying maternal vascular disease, such as chronic hypertension or an immunologically mediated placental vascular damage. Also, having multiple babies in the same time, as in twin pregnancies, increases the workload of the placenta, as more babies have to be supplied by the placenta in the same time and so can lead to ischemia. Uteroplacental ischemia leads to oxidative stress, which leads in turn to the production of toxins and mediators that enter the maternal circulation and lead to inflammation, endothelial dysfunction and activation of the coagulation system. This is the reason for all the complications that can arise in preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is also often associated with the development of generalized edema, which is due to the loss of proteins and so the decrease in total colloid pressure. Edema in the legs is very common in pretty much every pregnancy, but edema of the hands and face is more likely to be an indicator of preeclampsia. However, the edema itself is not enough to put the diagnosis. To recap and really imprint the hallmarks of preeclampsia in our mind, let's go through the defining criteria again. There are two really important things to remember about preeclampsia. First, the patient develops hypertension, so blood pressure of at least 140 to 90 mm mercury, newly after week 20 of the pregnancy and had a normal blood pressure before getting pregnant, and second, the new onset of proteinuria after the 20th week of pregnancy, with a level of at least 0.3 gram or 300 mg in 24 hours. Preeclampsia can also present in a more severe form. Criteria for severe preeclampsia are severe hypertension of at least 160 to 110 mm mercury at rest or on two occasions with at least six hours in between. Also severe proteinuria with at least 5 gram in 24 hours, oliguria, so urine output of less than 500 ml in 24 hours, cerebral or visual disturbances, pulmonary edema or cyanosis, epigastric or right upper quadrant pain, impaired liver function indicated by the rise in the liver enzymes such as ALAD, ACID and GGT, thrombocytopenia and a fetal growth restriction. To diagnose preeclampsia, we should make a complete blood count with special attention to the platelet count and lactate dehydrogenase, as well as the coagulation status. We can also make renal studies that include the serum blood urea nitrogen, creatinine and uric acid. For the renal study, we can make a 24-hour urine collection for the levels of protein and creatinine. Also, the fetus should be examined by a Doppler sonography of the child itself, but also the placenta. Here we can potentially see an intrauterine growth restriction, too little amniotic fluid, so oligohydramnios, and a decreased placental blood flow. Another variation of preeclampsia is the so-called HELP syndrome. HELP is an acronym and stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. It is a variant of severe preeclampsia that occurs in around 0.1 to 0.2% of all pregnancies. So luckily it is very rare. It has a high morbidity and needs to be investigated as soon as possible. It occurs particularly in women that have their first pregnancy after the age of 25 and usually occurs in week 36 of pregnancy or later, so basically just before birth. 
In around 20% of patients, hypertension is initially not seen, while one-third of patients will have a slight elevation of blood pressure and the other 50% will have severe hypertension. So the blood pressure is not a good indicator for the HELP syndrome. When patients are affected by this syndrome, corticosteroids as methylprednisolone or dexamethasone can help to reduce the symptoms and prolong the pregnancy a little bit, until the baby is ready to be born, or if it is already far enough that a child is developed enough, a cesarean section can be done. Usually the HELP syndrome resolves after the child is born. Patients with HELP syndrome are usually kept in the hospital under close observation as liver rupture, cerebral hemorrhages, acute kidney failure or placental abruption, DIC and pulmonary edema can sometimes occur. Now we will talk about eclampsia and how it differs from preeclampsia. So generally eclampsia is more severe than preeclampsia. A patient with eclampsia will also have a high blood pressure and elevated proteins in the urine, but also additionally to that, the patient has seizures. Those seizures are of tonic-clonic type, so with times of repetitive contraction and tonicity, so stiffening of the muscles, particularly of the arms and legs. It is important to make the differential diagnosis to other disorders that can cause seizures because in eclampsia, the seizure has to result from the preeclampsia and cannot be explained by other causes. Eclampsia, just as preeclampsia, also usually starts after the 20th week of pregnancy and most often it occurs close to term, so at around 37 weeks of pregnancy. The treatment of eclampsia is done in the hospital, where the patient usually also stays for close observation usually until the end of the pregnancy. Treatment includes magnesium sulfate that is given during and after pregnancy to treat and prevent seizures, as well as diazepam, which will usually end the seizure, but can also lead to sedation in the baby, and medications such as nifedipine or amiodarone, which lower the blood pressure. The patient is recommended to stay in a hospital room with minimal light and noise, to not cause more stress or precipitate seizures. Also corticosteroids are sometimes given to help the fetal lung to develop faster in case an earlier delivery than on term has to be considered. The baby is usually delivered by a cesarean section as safely as possible which can include to try to prolong the pregnancy in close observation or to induce a labor earlier if necessary to ensure optimal health for the mother and baby. In the next part we will talk about chronic hypertension. This is part of the umbrella term hypertensive disorders during pregnancy, but describes a high blood pressure that was already present before the woman got pregnant, or develops during the first 20 weeks of pregnancy, and is persistent for more than 12 weeks postpartum. Most women with chronic hypertension have essential hypertension, but some also have secondary hypertension that is due to for example renal, vascular or endocrine disorders. In some cases also a mild subclinical disease such as a vascular or renal disease was present before pregnancy but is exacerbated by the physiological stress of the pregnancy. This can make it really difficult to make the differentiation between preeclampsia and chronic hypertension. It is important to control the hypertension and to detect the potential development of a superimposed preeclampsia or intrauterine growth restriction of the baby due to insufficient oxygen supply via the placenta. Methyl dopa, calcium channel blockers, and libatolol are the most used antihypertensive medications in pregnancy. ACE inhibitors and angiotensin II receptor blockers should be avoided during pregnancy as they are potentially toxic to the baby. In mothers with chronic hypertension, the baby should be examined closely and frequently during the pregnancy by the use of an ultrasound. We want to check for the amount of amniotic fluid and the growth and heart rate of the baby. 
signs of superimposed preeclampsia are the development of proteinuria in a previously non-proteinuric patient that has chronic hypertension. That's it for this video, thank you for watching and if you like our channel, please subscribe. This video was requested in our community section of the channel. If you also have any video wishes, please feel free to share them with us there. Hopefully see you again in the next video.